April 2nd, 1945. Nearly 70,000 Americans are now in Okinawa. The question on everyone's mind was where were the Japanese? No major Japanese resistance had yet been encountered. Soon American forces advanced and cut the island in half. As was planned, army units in the 7th Infantry and 96th Infantry Divisions started heading south. The 3rd Amphibious Corps, under George Geiger, then started their advance north, with the 1st Marine and 6th Marine Divisions. Much of the north was forest and countrysides. Some units made contact with Japanese snipers and skirmishers, and some howitzers had to be silenced, but besides that, no Japanese units were discovered. Simon Buckner, commander of the 10th Army, then gave orders to Geiger to capture the northern part of Okinawa as fast as possible. The Americans had interrogated civilians and captured Japanese soldiers. From these reports, they discovered that the Japanese in the north were in the process of forming guerrilla movements. Speed was critical, and the Marines moved north as fast as they could. Nago, the largest town in the north, was soon captured. Commanding the Japanese in the north was Takedo Udo. He had about 2,500 men to defend the entire north. These were largely from the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, among other units, including Okinawan Home Guard. Udo himself was a classmate with Ushijima. But while the Okinawans loved Ushijima, they despised Udo. To the disgust of Japanese officers and enlisted men alike, Udo always had three women wait on him. Apparently, he had been afraid to fight the Americans without more support, which the men under him were appalled at. Overall, he was not the best commander, slow to react and unmotivated. His headquarters was at Yeitake, nearly in the center of the Motobu Peninsula. It was the place he planned to make a stand. After Nago, Marine and Japanese forces again met each other in skirmishes. Japanese forces had failed to conduct a proper withdrawal in some areas, so bridges were still intact, or their demolition only partial. The Americans soon entered the Motobu Peninsula. They started to make more and more contact with the enemy. This part of Okinawa was largely unknown to American forces. The peninsula was unable to be effectively photographed, and the ones gathered still left out important details such as trails and paths. Conquering the mountainous and hilly Motobu Peninsula were the 6th Marine Division, having former Marine Raiders in its ranks, as well as Guam and Saipan veterans. This unit was one of the most elite divisions at the Americans' disposal. Some units in the 6th Marine Division boasted an impressive 70% composition of combat veterans. On April 7th, the 6th Marine Division decided to do an aggressive reconnaissance of the peninsula. Marines went far into the peninsula and found abandoned towns. They did not make any contact with Japanese forces. A POW later noted that they were being watched the entire time, but the Japanese wanted to wait until larger American units entered the area until engaging them. The Marines soon started to grasp the situation of the terrain. It was extremely rugged. Rocky ridges rose to 1,500 feet and then transitioned into wooden valleys below. For the next couple of days, the Marines conducted patrols into the hills, attempting to find the Japanese forces. The Japanese, meanwhile, had the advantage of terrain knowledge, as well as being better equipped for mountain warfare, even possessing horses. As the Marines advanced into the hills of the center of the peninsula, they started encountering Japanese in mass for the first time. Marine William Manchester called it French and Indian fighting, as it was hit and run tactics. The Japanese were unsurprisingly very skilled in such attacks. Japanese snipers were some of the best yet encountered in the war. They mostly fired at men holding pistols, looking at maps, and ordering troops around. Generally, anyone looking like an officer. One common tactic was the Japanese to allow an American platoon to pass, then open fire on the company commanders and others coming through behind them. Major Bernard Green, commander of the 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, was killed by this method. And although the fighting was usually over very quickly, sometimes some serious firefights could rage. Among the skillful targeting of officers, the Japanese attacked Marine forces around late afternoon or dusk, too late for American forces to counterattack into the hills. Mines were also laid, but not effectively done and not buried deep enough to disrupt American forces. On the 10th, Unten was captured, and then Bice on the 12th. As the Marines captured more and more important towns, the Japanese grew more and more aggressive in their approach. But the Americans had numbers and resources on their side. One Japanese soldier had this to say about the American forces. 
Having blinded us with countless airplanes and shells, the enemy was marching. No. Walking leisurely ahead as on a picnic, those soldiers functioned as feelers. One shot from us and they immediately used their portable radios to contact the artillery. Our small position would be blown up, hell and all, in two minutes. The Japanese simply did not have enough resources to openly engage the Americans. Udo wanted to just delay the Americans and hope that he could keep his headquarters alive for a guerrilla war. But the Marines wanted to search and destroy the enemy, not leave them where they were. Soon Udo's situation worsened, however. American forces soon reached Tito Point and understood that Ye Take was where the enemy was. Marine forces then started to enter the hills in mass. Trucks and tanks were almost useless in the mountainous terrain, so the Marines had to hand carry all the ammunition and supplies. Upon entering the hills, the Marines had to clear out bunkers and caves with explosives and flamethrowers. On April 14th, Marine forces started their first attacks on Ye Take, taking the first couple of ridges. The Japanese again proved determined. Much like before, their fighting was at extremely close ranges. On April 15th, the Marines launched another attack. The fighting was textbook in some areas, but in others, it turned more sluggish. In some situations, Marines were forced to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but one by one, hills started to fall to the advancing Americans. On April 16th, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, supported by planes, artillery, and naval guns, attacked up the steep slopes of Ye Take. Soon, Marine forces were just a hundred yards from the crest, and then were attacked by Japanese motors, and then forced to move a little bit back down to more wooded terrain. Marine forces, however, made a general charge up to the top of the hill and killed all the defenders who did not flee. Later that day, the Japanese counterattacked, but were halted, losing as many as a hundred soldiers in this counterattack. This capture was only part of the enormous hill. Parts of it still needed to be captured. The 29th Marines attacked, but were halted by terrain and enemy resistance, but eventually they succeeded and popped smoke as a signal that the northern face was captured. Over 700 Japanese soldiers were killed in attempts to leave the area. One notable Marine was Corporal Richard Bush of Company C, 4th Marines. He was a squad leader and was wounded by Japanese machine gun fire. The aid station he was at came under grenade attack. He jumped on one of the grenades and shielded his men near him. He survived and was awarded the Medal of Honor. Udo, meanwhile, fled and managed to avoid the Marine forces. The other Japanese forces in the area were livid on why he did not fight to the death. The task of fighting the guerrilla war in this part of the Motobu then shifted to Captain Haru Murakama, a skilled and more aggressive commander. Udo soon made it to one of these camps, but a sign read, Udo's defeated little remnant gang not omitted. While the 6th Marine Division went into the Motobu, the 1st Marine Division had another objective. They lingered in the northern part of Okinawa for some time, protecting the 6th Marine Division's rear, conducting patrols, rounding up civilians for internment, and fighting several small skirmishes with guerrilla groups. They soon conducted a shore-to-shore -shore amphibious invasion to secure the eastern islands, an effort to deprive the Japanese of a valuable position behind the American lines, which had been done at Peleliu about half a year earlier. Marine forces then started and conducted patrols based on eliminating remaining Japanese troops and countering any guerrilla groups. Minus Saipan, Okinawa was the first major battle in which Marine forces encountered any significant civilian population. Upon landing on Okinawa, the U.S. divisions were allocated resources to deal with the civilian population. This included food and special units of doctors, translators, and other professionals whose entire goal was to see to the needs of the civilian population. The civilians were terrified of the Americans, having been exposed to Japanese propaganda. Most of the able-bodied were in the Japanese army, but still, many Okinawans were still in the north. Once they encountered Americans, many were still scared, convinced that the Americans had poisoned the food given to them, or that they were just toying with them. But over time, many started to see that the Americans were not as evil as once thought. Some even started cheerfully saying that this was the end of the Japanese empire. Events involving civilians were not always so decent. Some were disturbing, such as that with Marine Lieutenant Taylor Kinnerly. On patrol, the lieutenant heard rustling in a nearby set of bushes, and his squad opened fire. Children's and women's screams made him order the Marines to cease fire. For the most part, everyone was okay, but a boy had been hit. His arm was practically off, with some still dangling, and bone had splintered into the boy's arm. Kennerly then laid the Okinawan boy on a blanket and tried feeding him chocolate bars in an effort to calm him down and think of what to do. The company doctor was not available in the rear of the line. Corbin refused to amputate the arm 
as they had no prior training in amputations and didn't want to risk hurting the boy more. Kennerly found himself in a horrifying situation. He then decided that he'd be the one to do the amputation, but couldn't find anything sharp enough in anyone's packs. Out of options, Kennerly decided to do what he thought was best. He prayed to God to forgive him, and then, in order to save the boy from a long, agonizing death, decided to overdose him on morphine. He then was forced to tell the kid's parents what he did. Later that day, the company doctor had found Kennerly and told him that he had stumbled upon the family about an hour later, and he had treated the boy and amputated his arm. The morphine given was old and lost its strength. It actually had saved the kid's life. Kennerly was internally grateful. In most cases, the shooting of a civilian was an accident, but American atrocities did occur, and it would be completely naive to think that they didn't. These events did not help the situation, as the Okinawans were already more than convinced that the Americans were there to murder them. From when the North was formally declared secure, many Okinawans would fight in a guerrilla war until even after the end of the battle. April 20th, the North was formally declared secure. The 6th Marine Division counted 236 KIA, and about a thousand wounded, with about two thousand Japanese dead. The North was far easier than what was expected, but on some clear nights, Marines could see the flickering of lights. At the time, they thought it was lightning, and a distant rumble made them say it was thunder, but news started to come in from the South. Entire underground fortresses, cave systems so hidden that platoons didn't even know where they were being shot from, and tankers being pried from their tanks and bayoneted. The Marines knew what laid in store for them in the South, but no one wanted to believe it. But the Marines did not need to look south to see a battle. West of them, on the island of Aishima, the 77th Infantry Division, who had previously captured the Kareem Islands, just recently landed. It was supposed to be an easy fight, but the entire division was now engaged in a brutal slugging match with determined Japanese defenders. Mixed in the battle were perhaps the most radical civilians yet encountered in the Pacific War. That's what I'm going to talk about next time, the Battle of Aishima. Thank you guys for watching, and here's my sources.